Hey, hey. Hello, hello. Hey, hey, hey. Welcome to You Choose, a choose your own adventure style journey through the CNCF landscape. Where we're going to cover every stinking CNCF project. Yeah? That's the intention. We won't make it. So <laughs> don't, let, me, let me break your illusion immediately. <laughs> And then put you down on the ground, but yeah, that's the intention. That's the you know that's that's similar like you know when you, when you're like twelve and you say I want to be a pilot, right? But uh, yeah, you end up being a dentist. That's okay. <laughs> we'll do our best, you know. Within we're going to be reasonable people. Like if something is basically if a project's basically on its last legs, we're not going to cover it. We're going to um, honor your time and our time, but we're going to do our best. Yeah. Uh, right now we're in chapter three. We're covering security. This is this is episode eight in chapter three. So we've we've talked about this is the eighth security related system design decision that we're making. Because and it's not the last. <laughs> it's not the last. We have two more after this. <laughs> There's a lot, a lot, a lot to consider when it comes to security. I um. I went into this YouTube season knowing almost nothing, and now I'm uh, now hire me. I'm let me harden your cluster. <laughs> uh, no, it's it's um to me like if I had to just recap it all, I would just it all feels like it's a lot about policy, policies for every little thing. Yeah, it depends how you define policies. If you define them in a broader terms than you know, Kaverno or OPA, yeah, everything ends up being some form of a policy that allows or denies something from happening. Mm -hmm. Some sort of rule, it, like lots and lots of rules. And then we have this concept of zero trust, where we trust absolutely nothing and our, we make the rules to be about what you can do as opposed to what you cannot do. Um, and then, but in order to make rules, we need to establish like who's the subject that, of that rule. So in order to do that, we need identity. So that's what last episode was about, and that's what this episode is about too. Why do we have two episodes about identity? Ah, because now we switch to the more boring part, humans. <laughs> humans. <laughs> Yeah, last week I dedicated about... half of my career to get rid of them, and they they <laughs> keep coming back. That's why we're in tech. <laughs> why are we having to deal with humans? <laughs> this is not what I signed up for. <laughs> um, I actually left a career in wedding photography because I was fed up with humans. So what am I doing? Um, so last last week, well, this week we're going to talk about authenticating users to a system. But last week we talked about generally generating workload identity and specifically we talked about Spiffy, Inspire, and Athens. Let's Correct. Start. Yeah. Let's let's recap what we learned a little bit of what we learned last week. You go first. Uh, okay, Spiffy Inspire. Mm -hmm. Here's a one description. Uh, one sentence description of both of the tools in one sentence. You will not use them directly. It's part of something else. <laughs> That's a good question. I want to ask this to our guests later, too, is um, who's meant to use your technology, right? Um, so Spiffy, Spire, <coughs> Athens. So s first of all, Spiffy is a specification. <coughs> so therefore, it's not really an implement. The Spire is implementation of Spiffy. And then Athens also supports Spiffy's SVIDs, which we'll talk about in a second. But it is, I'm a little quiet, says the chat. Is that better? Um, uh, you're fine. Okay. And then, uh, so that it's, we asked the guests like who's meant to use it and it is meant to be, it's complicated to implement and it's meant to be implemented at like a system level or anything that has the same both Athens and Spiffy can act as a certificate authority. So anything that can use that um, as the same trust route is, is you implement it at that level. You're not thinking about it on a per application basis. So generally you have like a platform uh, engineer who have platform team or some sort of higher level at cluster admin concerned about these technologies as opposed to. Yeah, I mean, it, 
it's not that much that you cannot do it on for every single application separately, but it simply doesn't make sense because later on when you get to authorization of what applications can do, going back to the policies from before and so on and so forth, then you think on a more granular level, right? Mm -hmm. But when we talk about processes, the, the easiest thing and the most sensible thing is to say, okay, all of you, I want to know who all of you are. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, I want to know who all the... So what Spiffy is doing is establishing workload identity. And so what like why wasn't mtls good enough like isn't mtls doing the same thing it's establishing no, no. identity of a process no it's not that mtls is not good enough but think of it rather that for mtls to work it needs to know who who are the actors on each end of a mm -hmm. connection right so it's it's not that much that mtls is not good enough but Actually, MTLS needs to authenticate um, processes, right? Otherwise, how can it establish something secure it, if it could be anything, right? Right. That's but why. Isn't it already doing that with PKI certificates? Like, isn't that's the TLS? It's like generating a 509, a private key, and 509 certificate. It, and, and so now the question is does it have to use Pyre? It doesn't. Yeah. But it can. So, so then should. The que my question is, if X509 certificates exist, why did Spire get created? Because it's uh, assuming that you you think you talk about certificates generated individually for each workload precisely to avoid that. But uh, what, I think I think I disagree. Like, I think Spiffy is just a, a more secure way of doing it for uh, yeah. The Spiffy's SBIDs, like you have a Spiffy ID that itself is in a, in a cryptographically verifiable document, but then you also have um, the way it's attested. You have with, with Spire and with Athens, you have a server and you have agents, and the agents for Spiffy live one on each node. And so between the server and the um, agents, the agents can attest, hey, I'm on this node, hey, I'm this workload. And it uses a, a whole plugin system. So if you're, you're an AWS workload attesting yourself, you use an AWS plugin. And then the agent then also has plugins and can verify what the workload is attesting about itself. So Spiffy is like a third party thing that's um, helping to, uh, to, to coordinate this Confirm process that of, of verification, yes. And then you end up, that results in an SVID, which I believe is just a bundle of C, uh, PKI certificates, and including that Spiffy ID. And that SVID is then so much more secure than X, X, like a single X509 certificate. And then what I learned from uh, Frederick last week is what it does is, if you have two workloads that have S, each have an SVID, when they're connected to each other, they're so, that connection is so secure that you can have um, two workloads that are each in an untrusted network. Like the workloads don't trust each other's networks, but they do trust each other because they each have this SBIT. So it's an identity layer that goes on top of everything else. <laughs> That's my child's mind's way of trying to <laughs> explain all of this. <laughs> I feel like you're not that monkey. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't, I, I hope someone's here who could tell me like whether I'm missing a big part of it or whether, but that's after learning it about it a lot for the last couple of weeks. That's my, my, those are my takeaways. Okay. So a quick interruption. I'm um, looking at the comments. Yeah. You are, I probably cranked up my volume, but you are, you're low. So I'm low. turn on okay. your mic. I, I think I need to go into some settings. This is, settings are boring. Yeah, I have an, a, a, how's this? Is this better? I don't know. Uh, I don't hear. Now? Oh, you don't know. Because I yeah. hear only you. I don't hear myself. I cannot compare. But I'll let yeah. people in the comments uh, say okay. that you are still doing it wrong. To confirm <laughs> what we all know. <laughs> I, it's like, uh, almost like a cartoon. Like I go into this long co convoluted like description of what I think Spiffy is inspire. And then I'm just like, basically you can't hear the, any of it. 
it's just like she she looks like she knows. <laughs> Can't, I don't know what she actually said, but she she looks like she has conviction. So we'll go with it. <clears throat> we got we got a better in the chat. So thank you, thank you for letting us know about that. Um, cool. So that's that is mostly about Spiffy Spire. Athens supports Spiffy's <clears throat> Espids. Athens has the same um, server and uh, agent kind of thing going on. Uh, Athens agents are sidecars as opposed to one per node. And then Athens also has a, a, an access part to it too. So it's not only ident um, establishing identity, but it also can give roles and do some role-based access control stuff. So those are the difference between the two. That So last week we had Spiffy, but since it's a specification, you couldn't vote for it. And then we have Spire and Athens for the vote. Is there anything you'd like yes. to add? Nothing. I nothing. know close to nothing about those tools, so I'll, I'm letting you do the, do the <laughs> magic. You know slightly more than you did last week, though. We'll get, we'll get, we'll get you That's there. That's true. Um, so I think it's maybe time to reveal the winner. There we go. Ba -da -da. Spiffy. Spire. 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 Not Spiffy. Spire's the winner. Yes. And not the winner, the chosen one. Dang it. <laughs> That's what you tell yourself. Yes. <laughs> so that, uh, super. So now this is, comes the part of the episode where we implement the demo. There is no demo. We already did it uh, a few weeks ago when we did. Uh, so when we talked about MTLS, people chose Cilium and Cilium to provide MTLS needs spiff in the background. So it was already in a demo, even though we never talked about it. And that's that part about, of course, you can run Spire yourself, but it's very often part of other tools. And it happens to be a requirement for Cilium to implement MTLS, so we did it. In other service meshes, like, I'm not sure about this too, but Linkerd, which did have MTLS for a long time, but they now added support in the last release of Spire as well. So if you chose Linkerd, the demo would be still nothing. <laughs> Istio has support for Spire too, but just because it supports it doesn't mean that's what it, it uses out of the box, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, even Cilium doesn't use it out of the box. You need to go through extra uh, installation steps to to get it. But we did it, so I'm not going to do a demo or anything. So if you want to see and, and This demo, is the type of episode I like. There is nothing for me to do. I know nothing <laughs> about the subject, Whitney Speaks. There is no demo because it was already done. I'm like uh, Ikebana here, right? Like a part of the fringe. I can just put a pose and I can stay like this for the whole show. Uh, yeah. Uh, so if you want to see the demo, go to the Kubernetes scanning episode where we where we implemented Cilium and then you can see it. Yeah. There you go. There is so whole He's like, three seconds of the, how much it took me or five seconds to type the command to install Spire. <laughs> and then we did see like the the work the IDs that were coming through at the kernel level that Spire helped to generate somehow. But, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to today's episode where we're talking about authenticating human users to a system, mostly human users, just like Spiffy's mostly machine workload. Never say never. Never say always. Um. So, so what, when I think about authentication, I think about back in the early days of the internet where every website you visited, you had a separate username and a separate password and they all had different rules about how long they had to be or whether they can or cannot contain special characters. And it was hard to keep track of what's what and it was tedious to check out anywhere. And now I think of a world where it's like, oh, do you wanna use your Gmail account, your Google account to log into this totally random shoe website. Or you have something like LastPass. That's for passwords. But it I guess it's kind of I guess both. But LastPass isn't what we're talking about. Is it relevant as it's far as definitely I know, not. maybe to what we're talking definitely about? Definitely not. Today. 
But don't. But you have the, you have the user experience, yes, of logging like using Google or GitHub or whatever to log into lots of different websites. Oh yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I hate that part. That's that's why I mentioned last pass because yes, I, I I register once. That's easy, and then if everybody would decide to be on using Google authentication or GitHub or any of those, I would be happy, but they don't. So you randomly <laughs> need to type passwords that you don't remember anymore. And you don't remember them for a simple reason, because they all ask you to change it. Yeah, that too. Yeah, they make you rotate your own uh, <laughs> password. <laughs> And so, and I don't have post-its anymore to put it on my monitor, you know, kind of password. <laughs> Just one big sheet of notebook paper. I put it at the bottom under stuff in my drawer, so therefore, it's less likely to have anything go wrong, right? Um, what's the experience of that on the developer side then? Like the developer must like a zillion applications are all implementing <laughs> some sort of login protocol a zillion different ways. So everyone has to solve the same problem over and over again. I mean, typically a company is assuming that I'm assuming now that you're talking about the work in a company, right? Yeah, typically yeah. company would go for some kind of single sign on so that you sign somewhere. And then that authentication is used to provide author authorization wherever you're going, right? Depending on whether you should be able to access or not and things like that. Well, that that's definitely a use case, but there are two use cases here, I guess. Like there's that where like uh, companies need to provide access to their internal applications to their employees. But there's also Correct. like someone who's developing an application needs to ah. Me needs for users to be able to get to their application, and there's probably some sort of gateway that these users need, some sort of login situation these users need to go through <coughs> to get there. So as a developer, a lot of developers are having to solve that problem. Yeah. Uh, having to find a tool that solves that problem. Nobody writes, nobody solves that problem anymore, kind of, <laughs> for your own application, right? You're looking for, yes. a, for a solution because it's a common problem, right? Yeah, and that's, so, that's the spirit of development, right? Even though 90% of the time we do repetitive tasks that somebody else did already, but the goal is really not to work on things that are already done by somebody else. And yes, authorization yes. is definitely part of that. So, so you're saying authorization, which maybe you're not wrong, but there's like authentication and authorization and um, Yes, yeah. I mean, so and this is my limited knowledge, but basically, yes, you need the authentication, uh, but uh, you you don't need it for itself, right? But it's not the end uh, goal to yeah. authent uh, to authorize. Uh, sorry, to authenticate somebody or something. The end goal is really to authorize somebody or something, and the only yeah. way to authorize somebody or something is to know who or what that something is. And so to keep it accessible for everyone, authentication is providing identity or verifying identity. And authorization is providing access once you already have that identity. So, exactly. um, and now we're gonna get to where I'm feeling through in the dark a little bit where our experts are gonna help clear things up. But a lot of, it's, it seems like back in the day when we had to authenticate to every website, go through this login differently. It's because there were a lot of tools that were were providing this experience. And finally, we, and so I think a lot of those are OAuth two, Open Authorization two, um, tools. And that's that's Open Open Authorization Authorization two is the standardization that that has created the access token and the refresh token. And so the goal is to be able to get those. But then. Um, then the identity layer has is is solved by OIDC Open ID Connect, and the goal of that is to get an ID token. So you go through an Open ID Connect layer, get that ID token, and then it goes to an authorization layer with with OAuth two. But what's cool about OIDC is that you don't have to um, that your 
application never has to know any of your sensitive log information. It just gets that identity token and the sensitive information needs to get passed on once that's happened. So that's, again, Whitney's child's mind as she just learns everything. <laughs> it tries to put it into human speak. But did that see, all ring true to you, Victor? If I say no, I would be punished, right? No, I would. You, you wouldn't punished? speak with me or something like that. You would like? deauthorize me. <laughs> no, I'm like kidding. No, that, that I'm sounds wrong. just about right. <laughs> that sounds just about right. <laughs> I really, across the board, I feel like this has come up a few episodes now. I would love to, I love to hear what I'm wrong. I would love it much more than pretending I'm right and just letting me sail through life incorrect. Um, all right. So with that, I think that's enough. So when we're looking at these technologies today, both of these technologies have to do with logging in, I believe, to websites and a login flow and um, having a consistent login experience and a secure login experience. And so we're going to, and specifically logging in to maybe Kubernetes as the backend, that's at least what's happening in our demo, regardless of whether our technologies uh, choose to focus on that aspect of it. And then with that, I think we're gonna introduce our guests. Is there anything yeah, else bring them that on. people should know or think about when, when evaluating these two technologies? Probably, but that's why we have guests. <laughs> Let's bring on the experts to tell us. <laughs> All right. First, we have Maxime. Maxime, welcome. Thanks yeah, for being hello. here. Hi. Yeah, thank you for having me. Tell us about yourself, please. Uh, so my name is Maxime. People usually call me Max for short. I am the engineer in a startup company called Pelark. We are DevOps experts and we provide uh, a service uh, service uh, for other companies who want uh, digital transformation or who want to support the infrastructure, write pipelines for them. We do all these things. Yeah, I am in charge of developing our internal Kubernetes-based platform. Uh, usually during my work days, I'm searching for best open source solutions on market and uh, think about how to integrate these solutions in our platform. This is what I do for for a living, <laughs> and uh, oh. as my hobby, I am an open source developer. Uh, I ended up contributing to projects connected to authentication and authorization. Uh, I contributed a lot to Dex. That's why I'm the maintainer of the Dex project. There is awesome. a sign somewhere near my name, and <laughs> uh, and I also contribute a lot of uh, authentication improvements to kubernetes oh yeah. super cool and yeah, and it. can you victor and i trying to uh feel our way through what what your two technologies are about today is there anything you want to correct or say about uh, the most funny part you've talked about uh the, the part that i like the most is that uh the authentication uh standard uh -huh. being, uh, on top of authorization uh, protocol, uh -huh. OS, open authorization tool that you mentioned, and then used for, again, authorization. So authorization, authentication, authorization, like uh, Russian uh, matryoshka. <laughs> <laughs> like the yeah. dolls, yeah. yeah. It's, yeah, it's hard <laughs> as a beginner to wrap a head, a head around for sure. Cool, but we didn't see anything glaringly, glaringly wrong that needs correcting. No, I don't think so. Okay. So much confidence. <laughs> We're inspiring. <laughs> Thank you so much. We'll see you very soon for your presentation. Thank you, Maxime. Welcome, Alexander. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Whitney. Hi, Whitney. Okay. Hey. Tell us about yourself, please. Yes, I'm Alexander, or just Alex. I'm working as a um, software engineer at Red Hat, uh, full-time on the Keycloak project. So every day what I do commit on GitHub, it's all public, which is great. Um, yeah, and in my spare time, I, I do some baking, I also do some geocaching. Oh, I uh, love geocaching. Also main to maintaining some uh, open source software, for example, in, in the ASCII doc space. So if you have any point or tired of Markdown, if you then see it doesn't support the syntax you want to use, come over to the bright side of ASCII doc and uh, <laughs> meet me there. 
That's wonderful. Cool. Is there anything you want to clarify about anything Victor and I said up top about? No, that's fine. Uh, okay. That's good. <laughs> wonderful. Cool. Awesome. We're going to see you very shortly for your presentation. Thank you for being here. Yes, yeah, see you soon. All right. Thanks. And we're going to bring your your uh, slides up. And as soon as you talk, start talking, Victor's going to start your time. Uh, I also need to start my own timer, so to not go beyond <laughs> the limit. <laughs> Get gonged. Do it. It's a rite of uh, passage. Yeah. Uh, do, uh, can you give me some sign that uh, I <laughs> not go. Need to start? Go. Oh, thank you so much. So today we will. Uh, I will introduce uh, Dex to all of you. This is uh, an open source identity provider. There are some links to my GitHub and my LinkedIn accounts. Okay, so this, there is a, a statement from our website that uh, I think that shows perfectly what DEX is. So DEX acts as a portal to other identity providers through connectors. Uh, this lets DEX, uh, so what with connectors, we will uh, discuss it later. So this lets DEX uh, defer authentication to LDAP servers, SAML providers, or established identity providers like GitHub, Google, and Active Directory. Uh, so it is used to defer authentication. So clients write their authentication logic once to talk to DEX and then handles the protocols for a given backend. So this is uh, what DEX does. So the main idea of DEX is this picture, uh, literally. Like this is a splitter, kind of a splitter. Uh, as a result, DEX provides the standard OpenID Connect uh, interface that uh, user can use to communicate with the DEX. And as the backend, DEX can connect other identity providers using LDAP, OAuth2, other open identity providers, or SAML, or many, many more different providers. So this is the main idea of DEX. Uh, why engineers love DEX? So the first thing is that DEX uh, is ultra light. It's just a single binary written in Go, um, like approximately uh, 35 megabytes. So it's uh, pretty lightweight. Uh, the next thing is that DEX is simple. Uh, so the code base is simple. The concept is simple. You can just read the code for a couple of hours, and you will know all the concepts of DEX. Uh, and it's, uh, it makes it easier to debug DEX. It makes it easier to contribute to DEX or to fork DEX. So this is this simplicity helps with development. Uh, DEX is also Kubernetes native. So it was developed by the CoreOS company back in 2015 for like to authenticate users in their internal, uh, in their Kubernetes platform. Uh, so it was designed for Kubernetes and uh, it also can use Kubernetes as a storage backend. So it's, uh, uh, it's all, everything for Kubernetes. So it's community building block. So uh, it's used by many other products of community uh, of our Cloud Edge Computing Foundation, like Argo CD or Sixtor. They're our friends. Yeah. And DEX is through open source products. So uh, it's community driven project, not owned by a company. So it's completely independent. Uh, yeah. DEX architecture. So the architecture of DEX is uh, uh, like this. So in the middle, we have DEX. And as we discussed previously, DEX provides uh, open ID Connect interface that we can use to authenticate users uh, using uh, authorization code grant or something like this. And we can also authenticate machines using password credentials grant, token exchange grant, and so on. Dex, can, uh, Dex is a stateful service, so it, can, uh, it also needs something to store the data. For example, it can use uh, ordinary SQL uh, solution like PostgreSQL, MySQL, or SQLite. And because the Storage schema is simple. Dex can also use a key value storage like etcd, or uh, what is more important, Dex can use Kubernetes as the storage backend. So it can store data in Kubernetes custom resources. So it, it doesn't need any storage if it deployed in on top of Kubernetes. And it also can store data in memory. Um, other thing that Dex has uh, is uh, the connectors. So you can connect your existing uh, provider if you are. Um, enterprise company, like you can connect Active Directory or Okta or some other providers. If you're a small company, you can, can uh, and if you're a startup, you can you only have a Git repository, so you can connect a 
git to dex and authenticate through git and there are also two edge cases you can use local users or you can use mock connector to just use dex for testing so you can test authentication flow with these two connectors uh yeah that's the dexs architecture so there are some stats just to fill the time <laughs> so uh, nine almost 9k stars so 1600 forks uh, um, just a little more than 400 so PRs and issues and yeah so conclusion i don't <laughs> i don't have time to read the conclusion so use dex if you're enterprise company with authentication server uh if you're in cloud native environment and uh, if you like open source yeah thank you so much we got to uh, authenticate them all yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> I was Brilliant. still rooting for the gong. Yeah, that was a beautiful, beautiful presentation. Great job. Uh, but just a reminder to everyone, I'm going to take you off the screen now and we'll see you pretty soon, Maxime. Uh, just a reminder for everyone, please ask your questions now. We're gonna oh, yeah. Go. Yeah. It's mandatory. Person. It's not optional. <laughs> Every single person here. No, no, that would be too many questions. But if you have a question, we want to know. We know who you are. <laughs> we'll get you. We'll revenge. <laughs> All right. Please do ask your questions. And next up, we have Alexander. Thank you for being here. And you're going to teach us about Key Cloak. Thank you so yes, much. And Victor will tell you when to start. Go. Okay. Let's give it a go. So, yeah, it's about Key Cloak. And just a brief slide what's an identity and access management solution? And do I need one? Well, as we said, it's machines, it's users. They want to log in, uh, they log in with Keycloak, uh, and with the token they receive from the from this uh, login request, they access the services, and the services can then verify the token. And Keycloak um, provides authentication, authorization. It can manage all your users' credentials and permissions. Um, so I know customers who are running it for millions of users uh, and, and several millions of sessions. Uh, it can handle also user registration, a password reset. So it's not only authentication the users, but also managing all their credentials and helping users to reset them as well. In the latest release, we also had preview access, um, preview feature for passkey. So if you want to run your own passkey, uh, you can use Kicklock for that. Um, yeah, and then a Keycloak journey is usually day zero. You start as a developer with it. Uh, day one is then you do single sign-on for all your applications in your organization. And then day two is becoming fl more flexible in your setup. And day three is then eliminate some daily churn. So as a developer, you get started. Um, you download a single container or extract an archive of your choice. It also works great with test containers if you're into test containers to test your application and you can configure it using CLI, API, Web UI, export, import. So it might be as simple as running a Docker container with either Docker or Podman, or the second command is then to actually import a realm from a JSON uh, with all the data that you already pre-configured in the previous step. So that's Keycloak as a developer. And then you get an UI where you can configure things and learn about uh, how to set up all the stuff. And then you export it as JSON. And in the next step, you might then use the command line to update things. And well, once you roll out single sign on your application, users need to remember only one password. Um, they authenticate only once a day. You add maybe a second factor, or maybe you roll out pass keys, right? Um, you theme the login front end, and I'd say, it makes even sense to roll out Keycloak for a single application. And then you have a login screen like this that you show to your users once in the morning. And then you get more flexible uh, because you want to integrate, like we've seen with Dex, you want to integrate LDAP and Kerberos, all your existing infrastructure about security that you have. And you want to broker to existing SAML services, you want to broker to OADC services, and use all the data that is there, maybe enrich it, maybe create the token, create the user info endpoints that you need for your framework to get the information um, that you need. Maybe you have an old um, user base, database somewhere that you integrate. Maybe you want to do a skim integration. And that's then cool on day two. And maybe you even don't have a login page if you have rolled out Kerberos in the organization because then 
Kickler will pick up the Kerberos token and exchange it with an OIDC token or SAML token for your applications. And you can use in login using GitHub, well, the way you configure it, that's your choice. And day three is the animated churn. So if you have then hundreds of thousands, millions of users, you want to automate things. So people need to do things when you log in. Maybe you want some people to set up a second factor uh, for added security. You mark a user to do that on the next login. If you have so many users, they forget their password, you need to uh, provide a mechanism to recover passwords, and Keyclock does that. And even if the users are stored in LDAP, Keyclock will provide the front end and sends out all the emails and all the stuff to reset the user's password. Users can also self-register, so we have a configurable form there. Um, users can then manage their data afterwards themselves, uh, being it stored in Keyclock's database or in um, an LDAP or another directory of your choice. So it really resolves the need for users to call or create tickets or write emails. So that's the login screen if you then enable some of the options that you have a forgot password option, a register uh, button or link uh, on the login screen. So that's how it evolves over time. And user self data management, just a short screen. So Keyclock is an open source identity and access management solution to authenticate and authorize users and services. You can configure it interactively or fully automated. You can bridge to existing inf security infrastructures and then extend and customize it as needed. You can run it at scale in the cloud and the not cloud environments. That's your choice here. And here's some links for Keycloak, how to get started uh, with the Keycloak. Uh, that's a Keycloak book. Of course, there are containers, there are operators. And that's it. That's five minutes, right? Amazing. Uh, Victor will have to, Victor's a timekeeper, but. Yeah, yeah. Just five minutes, exactly. Oops. Brilliant. <laughs> wow, you all are great. Thank you so much. We also had a lot of good questions roll in during that time. Um, but one thing I wanted to ask that I mentioned at the beginning of the show is who who's meant to use each of your technologies? Who's, who's the user for you, Maxim? So for us, uh, I believe uh, if you already have uh, uh, some identity provider, but this provider, for example, only can speak uh, LDAP or SAML, so it cannot uh, work with OIDC. And uh, you need to authenticate your users in Kubernetes. So as we know, mm -hmm. Kubernetes only support, uh, supports IDC providers, so you need something uh, to authenticate your user using your old catalog, and Dex can help you there. You can okay. use Dex if you need some uh, something lightweight for a small team. Uh, so if you don't have, for example, a proper identity provider, but you have something like GitHub or GitLab, if you're a small team and you only have Git uh, and you only want to commit, <laughs> you don't want to deal with things like uh, a Google authentication or Okta, you just want to write the code and authenticate users in Kubernetes. So you can use your Git. This is uh, the second thing. So is that uh, meant for like app application developers or platform engineers or both in different contexts? Uh, this is for uh, with Dex you can uh, secure anything running in your cluster or even something not in your cluster. This is a generic purpose provider, but uh, uh, the audience I uh, am expecting is uh, <coughs> Kubernetes uh, platform engineers working okay. with Kubernetes. Interesting, cool. For the for then, platforms, yeah. One thing that, uh, I'll get to you, Alexander, I won't forget, but one thing Ale Alexander said during his presentation, he talked about like supporting millions of users and you just talked about supporting like a smaller team. Does Dex also work at a really large scale for like millions of users Yeah, too? yeah. The thing okay. that you need to make Dex working with uh, the larger groups of people, you just need to set up key clock and then connect it to, through Dex uh, to your ah. community cluster and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> just like everything, the yeah. technology work well together i love that cool yeah, and because, uh, I, I wanted to add that dex uh, completely relies on other providers uh, because uh, it is expected to that uh, your customer they already have something in the infrastructure and uh, probably key clock or anything else and uh, you as a platform engineer you can connect this key clock to uh, your platform using dex or 
if your customer have uh, customers have another authentication providers you can connect them also so it's like a unified solution for gotcha. this gotcha and then alexander who do you think is meant to use key cloak who's the persona um yeah some organizations use it to authenticate their employees with all the applications that they have in their organization so mm -hmm. um those applications might be running in a Kubernetes cluster, they might be running outside of a Kubernetes cluster. So, the, And the essential thing is you log in once a day or, mm -hmm. or how long you choose your session to be. And then but, you oh log yeah. in for everything. Um, so my question, then, I guess, is yeah. who implements it, not who is the one logging um, using it. I think usually a, an application developer who's maybe ra creating their own CRM application or customer front end, they will, uh, they will be looking for an OADC um, solution and they pick Keycloak when they develop the application and they teach the application to talk about ADC and then they well have a look around in the organization who runs it on their Kubernetes cluster <laughs> um, as a managed service hopefully um, and then yeah but then it would be an operations team running it mm -hmm. but the developers okay. who will pick it originally when they develop the application or an operations Excellent. team who picks it to provide an OIDC to using maybe via Dex for a Kubernetes cluster or other solutions. Nice. Oh, you mentioned Dex too. I love it. Um, I'm going to get to the user questions now. Thank you so much for answering mine. The first one is: Does Dex provide any GUI or dashboard? Uh, mm, so it only provides uh, a gRPC API to configure mm -hmm. Dex. But there are also some screens. For example, there is a login screen. There is a device uh, code screen. If you use, uh, for, if you want to authenticate your vacuum cleaner using Dex, it's also possible. Uh, so there are some uh, screens, but not uh, a dashboard to configure Dex. Uh, there was a request from community, but uh, I didn't manage to find the person. <laughs> So <laughs> we, we didn't go far with this request, but we at least have uh, uh, an API. Excellent. And then this question, maybe I don't 100% understand. Why would you have service accounts as your source of auth data? Is that more for someone who's meant to work in the cluster, like develop on the cluster? With service accounts, I think of like providing identity to machines more than people. Victor, do you understand this question? No, I'm read, reading it and rereading it, and I, I, don't, I don't think I understood it. So maybe, okay. unless one of the guests understood, uh, Evgeny, yeah. just we clarify you, a bit more. Yeah, we invite you to ask your question again. I have a, an assumption that probably uh, they think that it's not worth it to authenticate uh, users in Kubernetes using the OIDC provider because you only can use service accounts. But uh, with service accounts, you cannot rotate the token of a, of a service account. You need to maintain um. it. You, can, you need to store it securely. So that's not always an option. Uh, sometimes it's better to stick to short living tokens like uh, OIDC provides, for example. And again, it prevents the personal login information from needing to be to go through all the way to the application. It can stay yeah. at the identity. Yeah. <laughs> Bless you. Um, so the next question is, how simple is it to use Dex or Keycloak with a, a SaaS based solution? So let's start with you, Alexander, on that one. Um, with a SaaS based application. So, well, you might then be running Keycloak inside of your organization and then have a SaaS based application being like somebody runs something in the cloud for you. Um, and they, as they will be running this in the cloud, they will, hmm, how would that work? So you would register, you were running the Keycloak and you would um, register that other application uh, as a client in Keycloak. So basically you exchange some a secret, a shared secret, um, some URLs, and then it starts to work. <laughs> to <make it. laughs> Excellent. So, but I guess you would need to have access to the code of that application, wherever it's running, right? To, to add uh, the logic, no? No, I would believe that the other application already supports either SAML or OpenID Connect. And yeah. then it's just a matter of configuration. And I would hope most applications yeah. do that today. And it's a SaaS-based application. 
Ed, what about you, Maxine? Yeah, I believe the same thing goes to Dex. Uh, except if you run Dex on top of Kubernetes, uh, it will be a little bit easier for you to start to begin with. Uh, but uh, in other terms, it's the same. Excellent. And Maxime, let's start with you for the next one. Are there any auditing capabilities built into DEX, maybe through event notification? Uh, unfortunately, no, only login, uh, mm -hmm. but there are not so, so, so much info in logs. So I can't even say that you can have this information uh, in any way in DEX uh, as of today. Yeah, but we have metrics uh, without <laughs> without <laughs> auditing, but you can just uh, get some info about uh, errors or about requests, but that's it. That's all telemetry we have uh, today. Excellent. And what about for Keycloak? Uh, for Keycloak, uh, yes, we have events of all the things that are happening, both on the user side when they authenticate, when they refresh their tokens, also for admins doing things in the admin UI or the CLI. And those events then either end up in the log, um, you can then format administration, they end up in a database, or we also have a, an extension or an extension point of service provider interface, as we call it. We then connect any service that should consume these events and either react to these events, or maybe even reject a login from happening if you choose so, or just store them securely in a remote uh, store. Excellent. So it was the wrong answer. I, I, I had to say that uh, you can extract all the info from key clock. You don't need events index. <laughs> <laughs> that, <that's it. laughs> um, the next one is a great question. It has a comically large amount of uh, acronyms. So I'm gonna, if I have a business to business software as a service, so I need to integrate with multiple customers, single sign on. IDP internal developer platforms and manage those integrations centrally. Do Dex and Keycloak support that? Let's start with you, Alexander, please. Um, uh, small correction. Uh, yeah. I'm guessing that uh, we're talking about SSO identity provider, not oh, that internal makes more developer sense. platform. Okay, cool. Everybody's yeah. confused. Uh, <laughs> internal developer platforms should never have got an acronym IDP. <laughs> All right, Alexander, what do you have to say to answer this um, Al's question? Yeah, you you can connect to, well, assuming that those, well, so it's a B2B platform and all these other, I run a business and all the other business um, are providing or authenticating their own employees, assuming they have maybe an OIDC service or summer service there, then you connect them to Keycloak. Um, you could also connect them using LDAP, but that would be very uncommon. So usually OIDC or SAML that they provide, and that's working with Keycloak. Excellent. And how about for DEX? Uh, another uh, <laughs> convenient question. <laughs> uh, so uh, DEX uh, is identity provider, but it pretends to be identity provider. So uh, this is the question about the identity provider capability, one of them. But DEX, uh, so to provide the single sign-on uh, for your application, you need to manage user sessions and you need to have a concept of users inside your provider, but DEX doesn't have it. <laughs> so, uh, if, for example, if you connect uh, some provider that supports uh, SSO, for example, GitLab or Keyclock or other providers, then you will have it. So, if not, unfortunately. Perfect. Thank you. I have a question. So you talk about using Keycloak with Dex. What would be the advantage of using them together? What does Dex add on top of Keycloak? Um, I can say that, uh, for example, if you're building uh, a platform mm -hmm. and you want uh, not only for your organization, but you want to sell it outside, there are many mm -hmm. great companies on CNCF Camp that do exactly this thing that provides the platform as a product. Uh -huh. Yeah, and if you have the platform, you you doesn't know you don't know um, which provider is uh, uh, that your customers have. Uh, 
So ah. you don't know. That's it. why uh, it's simply to have DEX because for this use case to just connect this provider to Kubernetes, key clock will be uh, an overkill. Got it. Thank you. Um, how, how, this is one's for Alexander, how do you back up key cloak running in EKS? So, uh, backing up meaning like creating a database uh, backup and then later restore it, that's what I assume. So, uh, key cloak stores all the information in the database when it comes to users and groups and roles. Um, so, you, that's simple to back up. Um, also, if you choose offline sessions, they're also sort of stored on a, a SQL database and we support MySQL, Postgres, MSSQL, MariaDB, um, MSQL Server. Yeah, hopefully I didn't forget in the database. Um, the running, the, the other session, the, when you log in in the morning, those sessions are just stored in memory for performance reasons. Um, they're not backed up. Um, but then you can still cluster that um, either in, in a single site running multiple key cloak nodes or something that I've been currently working on. Um, hopefully next in the key cloak 24 release, we will officially support a multi-site setup of key cloak um, with all the things you need, for example, how to configure Aurora um, on AWS in a multi-AZ setup and fading over between the two AZs. That's the stuff I'm doing during the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you that, for that answer. Um, uh, Maxime, does there exist a ready to use solution to integrate with Backstage? I think, mm, I think you can use both uh, for Backstage uh, and I think Backstage supports IDC. So uh, I think it doesn't matter what to use. I think both uh, key clock index has a uh, getting started and uh, easy to install one liner uh, that you can type in into your uh, terminal so it's um, i don't think it's a problem nowadays Ex at least excellent yeah Do you agree? correct yeah. me if i'm wrong but basically the question is not that much whether uh key clock or dex support exists in backstage or anything else, but whether that application, in this case backstage, can connect to OIDC, with OID, to OIDC providers somehow, right? If it can, then it can be anything, right? Right, definitely. Excellent. The next one's for you, Alexander. I heard Key Cloak is extremely difficult to manage. I've heard there are providers that just manage and sell Key Cloak services. Uh, what are your thoughts on the overhead for running it? Yeah, that's a good point. So um, let's start with the middle. And um, yes, there are providers that uh, manage and sell key clock services. That's true. Um, with the first part, I think we're getting better and better at this. Um, so previously, it was um, um, a, um, a Drabos application server based Java application, um, which was very well if you're not familiar with the java world difficult to configure and set up um we now and switch to the quarkus based application that is then smaller footprint simpler to configure also simpler configure uh, operator so i say yes we're getting better at this um, um and well the overhead yes there's probably an overhead um but it, um overhead that it uses more memory um but then it's case for maybe for more users has more features so that's maybe the trade-off that you have my understanding with the two of your technologies is that's what that's the big thing that differentiates it is key cloak is much more fully featured but then heavier weight and uh can be more difficult to manage dex is extremely lightweight and easy to use is that correct there is a, there is a living proof of, about of this statement the book about how to manage key clock so there yeah. is there is even a book exists <laughs> <laughs> i think i think oh uh, like uh, you can uh, print all, like every single line of dex code and it will not be the book it will be like a brochure or something like this. <laughs> um this question is does key cloak support mfa i believe you said in your presentation that it does is that correct yeah, we support MFA, um, cool. so are uh, the usual token-based, uh, time-based, um, and well, as I said, passkey if you if you choose to do so. Um, cool. That's a preview so feature. 
Multi-factor authentication check. Um, would you need an operations team to manage Key Cloak? And again, what's the overhead of using of managing Key Cloak as a service? I well, I'd say it depends on how how twenty four seven you want to run it. <laughs> yeah. So if you're running it for a million users and you it, uh, you're I don't know, your company depends on it, then you probably have a team of maybe seven, ten people running it around the clock with people on call. <laughs> so, um, but still, if you're running it for securing your services just used during daytime, it might be a part-time job. So it's more like the availability and the amount of questions people have. Yeah. So and then, in our uh, company, in our mm -hmm. company, we, we have the team to manage key clocks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. How many people do you use for, to manage it? For, um, for external or for internal? Just curious. Internal Let's use uh, the team of three, I would say. Cool. Do, uh, is there a key cloak management as a service you suggest? Uh, um, there are multiple. There are multiple. It depends on what kind of service you're looking for. I might not state something here. That's all right. Th that's fair. I pass on this <laughs> one. <laughs> I respect it. Um, you said during your presentation, Maxime, Argo Dex supports Argo CD and SigStore, correct? Uh, yeah, Dex is included in their Helm chart uh, in Argo CD's Helm chart. So uh, when you install Argo CD, you also install Dex. Oh. Uh, I believe because it's just the simplest way to run it on top of Kubernetes and to provide uh, authentication capabilities. That's that's it. Awesome. Um, what's a use case for using Dex or Keycloak that surprised you? Oh, that's a fun question. Like how or where it's used. Uh, I know that's one that takes some thinking. Who wants to start? Uh, I can say that uh, on the upcoming Cloud Native Projects conference, I will be talking about DEX and the use case that amazed me the most and about the new feature <laughs> of DEX. So it's just a promotion. <laughs> like, yeah. You're not going to tell the answer? <laughs> what's the DEX? What's the use case that surprised will, you the most? I will tell you uh, oh, in a couple of <laughs> Rude. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, Awesome. Uh, are you going to be rude too, Alexander? Will you actually tell uh, us yeah. one? I, I, have an, I have one thing. Um, for example, there are some of these electric scooters in the cities uh, that you mm -hmm. then rent and stuff. And then I have a setup where each of these scooters has uh, is registered as a client in the Keycloak instance cool. <laughs> so that it can interact with stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, each of the scooters is a machine logging in and using Keycloak. Wow. These technologies are um, more tangible than a lot of other ones that we've worked with. Like as a user, as a regular human on the planet, like my mother's probably interacted with these things. Not that my mother's ridden a scooter, she's not. But, um, <laughs> but they're, yeah, touchable. So how about support for coder environments? I guess I don't understand what the question part of that is. Do you have a guess, Maxime? Mm. I'm not sure, but uh, as I mentioned before in my presentation, uh, for the coders, uh, for coders, uh, you can use Dex uh, as a testing uh, authentication provider just to test your authentication flow because there is a mock connector, there is a memory storage for Dex, so it's uh, you can you need to just simply run a single binary and test your authentication in. Dex, like to run uh, integration tests or end-to-end -end tests, that's the easy thing, and I think that is helpful for developers. But uh, I'm not sure about the question. <laughs> right on. Uh, yeah, I think it goes in that direction that uh, that you said. It's about how to get started as a developer with that. Um, on my slides, I had this. You can start it from a container and use it locally, and I think at the beginning, it you could probably use any thing that is probably lightweight and provide an OADC login. Uh, as you said, Texas might be a lot more lightweight than Keycloak. Then maybe maybe after two months, maybe after six months, maybe after 12 months, you discover that there are so many features in OADC, like step up authentication. For example, you're logging in first, you go to the application, and then you do something sensitive like transferring money. And then you want to redirect back and do step up authentication. So there are lots of features in 
here that you might want to use here and there and um, at some point you probably well you need to figure out if the, the testing solution you use as a developer is that supporting that or not so Keyclock tries to be as lightweight as possible um, but you can mm -hmm. start out with a JSON with all the data but um, at the beginning it might look fat but then you discover the features right on um, is Keycloak PCI and HIPAA compliance yes uh, I don't know. Uh, it depends on how you configure. That would be the consultant's answer. <laughs> <laughs> it depends. <laughs> um, yeah, but I, I know that some certification that we were passing is accessibility checks. So we put a lot of effort in the UI of uh, logging in and account console that they're now accessible for everybody. Amazing. And this is the last question. So if anyone has any more questions, speak now. Um, what are the limitations for DEX and for Keycloak regarding the number of users and roles? Let's start with you, Maxime. Mm, we don't have roles, uh, mm -hmm. uh, but users, I don't think that there is any problem to scale it to millions of users because it's only depends on the database and uh, the database schema of DEX is simple so it's not not a problem to scale dex probably it's a problem to scale the upstream provider to this number of users and th th that is the real challenge but dex is uh, scalable as, as you wish as you want mm, yeah in terms of web uh, dex uh, uh, dex itself is stateless so you can scale just workers of dex uh, you can deploy them as many as you want and they will be working together splitting the load so that's it Awesome. And what about for Keycloak? Um, yeah, it's for Keycloak. It's you can have probably as many users in the database as the database can hold. Um, the scaling then starts to get more problematic once you, with all the concurrent users that you have, all the sessions you need to hold, it then takes more and more memory. Um, and we decide to keep all the mem uh, sessions in memory to um, be really, really fast. You can also choose offline sessions, but that's, yeah. But then for the, t yeah, it's, if you have roles, it usually scales, but if you nest the roles and nest and nest and nest, then it gets slow, um, mm -hmm. but then you might be better off connecting external LDAP because it's more performed to store the data. So you can have DEX in front, Keylog in the middle and LDAP <laughs> in the back end. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, no. We we are getting more questions. So, um, is Keycloak able to replace MS Intra or AWS IAM Cognito Smoothie? Oof. Never done is that. Um, I know that people put it in between. In between what? Um, some MS Intra. Well, I'm not an expert on that. I'm passing on this one. That's okay. not my specialty. I respect it. Cool. Does Red Hat um, have any thinking of putting out an option to manage Keycloak as a service? Um, I'm here representing the Upstream Open Source Project with it uh, owned by CNCF now. I'm not commenting on Red Hat. Things Love there. it. And then if I plan on having millions of users, what would be the best way to set up Keycloak? Uh, you would need to find out how many users are active at the same time. So that's a key number and how many users would be logging in per second. And then we have a sizing guide on our homepage that you can calculate memory and CPU usage. You need to decide uh, if, you, if one site is enough or if you want to do two sites and two availability zones. Um, yeah, you pick a database. Uh, stuff but maybe add some more memory to a kubernetes cluster and then give it a go <laughs> that's amazing so there's a sizing guide on the key cloak website to figure yeah. it out awesome and oh, that's oh, yeah. we can also call it a sizing book <laughs> 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 uh, we actually yeah we try to make it a one pager but still yeah <laughs> <laughs> what is one page when you have infinite scroll <laughs> um so we have our closing statements now. So Dex, we, um, Maxime, will you tell us 
in a couple of sentences why folks should vote for DEX to be implemented uh, in our ongoing demo? Um, DEX, uh, now currently it's a sandbox project, so it's an underdog in this <laughs> uh, rivalry. <laughs> so uh, it's always better to vote for underdogs. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait for it. I voted. <laughs> <laughs> he just won Victor's vote that way. <laughs> nice. Yeah, um, and that's, that's probably it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Maxime, for sharing your time and your expertise with us today. Goodbye. All right, Alexander, why should we vote for Key Cloak? Well, if you want to go into the rabbit hole of figuring out what OADC can do for you with all these features, uh, then give Key Cloak a go. Um, the more you eat, the more hungry you're going to be to discover more of OIDC. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Thank you. Thank you again. Wait, now I need to change time. my vote. <laughs> <laughs> See you around for that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. All right, here we are. We have our, do we have our vote um, URL, uh, URL handy? Yeah, somewhere, somewhere. Wait, I'll find it, I promise. Here we go. There, there's there it the, it's also in the description. You don't need to memorize it. 3NV7NHW, not yes. hard either. So, so that link is going to take you to the CNCF Slack workspace, to the You Choose channel where you can make your voice heard. And whichever, yes. And you should be in CNCF for, uh, Slack anyways. Yeah. Absolutely. Th that's if where you're a fan should of be. The show, yeah, you really should be up in there. And it's a great Even if show. you're not a fan of the show, you should be in CNCF. <laughs> you can ignore the show. That's fine. But yeah, go to CNCF Slack. I'm, <laughs> I'm making an assumption that you're if you're still watching us past the hour mark, that you must have some sort of affection for the show. <laughs> or you're a masochist, depends. <laughs> um <laughs> So yes, you could join the CNCF Slack if you haven't already in the YouTube channel. Vote for which technology you want us to see implemented in our ongoing demo. And whichever technology gets chosen is the one we'll implement next week. And yeah. I believe that's a wrap. Yeah, next week we're going to talk about some different technologies that have to do with access. Once you're, once you're authenticated to your Kubernetes cluster or to your cloud environment, um, how do you control what can be accessed and what cannot? So three different technologies around that. That's it. We did it. Okay, we did it. All right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Let me close this thing. <laughs> Bye.